Hello, and welcome to the Digital Free Thought Radio Hour and WOZO Radio 103.9 LPFM here in Knoxville, Tennessee. We're recording this on Sunday morning, December 10th, 2023. I'm Larry Rhodes, or DJ Doubter 5, and as usual, we have our co-host, Wombat, on the line with us. Hello, Wombat. Um, the wombat. Oh, these arms are looking pretty good right now. Okay. They are. Yeah, you, you got those <laughs> guns ready there. <laughs> and guns our special out. guest, the uh, Dread Pirate Higgs. Welcome. Western Canada. Hi. Digital. Cool. Nice. Digital Free Thought Radio Hours, a talk radio show about atheism, free thought, rational thought, humanism, and the sciences. And conversely, we'll also talk about religions, religious faiths, Pastafarianism, gods, holy books, and superstition. And if you get the feeling that you're the only non-believer in your town, well, you're just not. Here in Knoxville, in the middle of the Bible Belt, we have a group of 1,100 of us. We're the Atheist Society of Knoxville, or ASK, and we'll tell you more about us after the mid-show break. So be sure to stick around. Wombat, what's our topic today? I want to talk about pleading but not just any kind of pleading not just like in court not yeah court no pleading. no this pleading is special very special <laughs> special pleading if you will we're going to talk about it throughout the show today and then if we have more time we'll talk about legacies I'll also go into listener comments today as well thank cool. you guys so much for all your comments let's dump into some pleading but before we go into that i'd love to get into some pasta dictions or be let through our past addiction by our own Dread Pirate Higgs. Go on ahead. All right. Camera on. Our nice. heavenly Lord, who art in a colander, Al Dante be thy noodles. Thy blood be rum, thy sauce be yum, with meat, as it is with vegetables. Give us this day our garlic bread, and forgive us our cussing, as we forgive those who cuss against us. And lead us not into ketoism, but deliver us some carbs. Mm. Thine are the noodles and the meatballs and the grog whenever and ever. Amen. I have noted that um, I was playing disc golf uh, this weekend, and I noted that someone was flying around with an FPV drone. I know it was an FPV drone because it was doing maneuvers through trees in a way where someone had to have seen the flight of the the drone from the drone's perspective in order to navigate that well i think they're mm -hmm. building like some video of like hey here's some paths that you can take and i just want to like film myself play i never found the pilot but i did find the drone and i thought to myself wow how cool it would be to uh fly like that through the woods have that experience but i also worry about the paranoia that people can have uh being seen play through what looks like a security camera on on wings right but then I thought I threw the idea up to like, you know, isn't that what the whole God is in a, in a weird way? And my brain, my weird atheist brain, I I have this weird thing where I can't keep thinking. I can't stop myself from reminding myself of all the contradictions in society, left and right. Every single time I see something like a security camera being like, I and hearing people being like, we hate security cameras, but you love God looking at your actions every single day. Right, right? Right. Yeah. And they're like, no, no, but that's different. <laughs> yeah. right. I don't want to have that conversation with them. Um, in my mind, it, it irks me when people aren't consistent with, you know, their rationale for what they prefer to have and what they don't prefer to have. Like, why can't we just have right. one right. criteria? Why are you making right. special excuses for yourself? Or should I say right. special, special pleadings? pleadings. You yeah. know, special that's pleadings. how I define it, though. I wonder how everyone else would. Dread, would you like to give me a definition of how you define special pleading? Maybe examples of that? Yeah, well, you know, certainly you made a, gr a great case there. Is uh, You know, uh, for instance, I had a conversation recently with someone about uh, supernatural stuff. Yep. And, uh, you know, I pointed out that, uh, you know, I don't believe in ghosts. I don't believe in, uh, you know, the Christian God. I don't believe in the same angels, uh, giants, demons. witches, real magic yeah. tricks. Yeah, et cetera. Yeah. 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 And so uh, in this person, of course, uh, was agreeing with me for the most part, but then said, but I believe in ghosts. Ghosts are real. <laughs> of all you the know? things. So he doesn't believe like, in well. You know, how, 
yeah, it doesn't believe in all the other stuff, but, you know, makes a special case for ghosts because he saw one. Oh, right? and, interesting. And it's usually, it usually works that way. That, that's what I find anyway. Another one is, uh, uh, you know, pseudoscience in medicine. Yeah. They don't believe in acupuncture. They don't believe in Reiki. They don't believe in um, all kinds of stuff, but mm. chiropractic. They believe yes. in chiropractic. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that up. So that's that's a case of special pleading, yeah. Dred, you may have to clarify what you mean by chiropractic because we have a lot of listeners on the show, particularly in America, who aren't aware of what chiropractic is versus physical therapy. Would you mind just like highlighting the difference between the two? Because some people will be like, wait, I have a chiropractor. Yeah, well, yeah, sure. Yeah, so uh, chiropractic was invented, I believe, in, well, it's not even 100 years old. Um, but it was uh, a guy that uh, figured that some ailment uh, bothering somebody was the result of what they call a subluxion in the in the spine, and so that doing an adjustment of the spine somehow uh, remedied um, this affliction, and it just it just went crazy. It just people are just lapping this stuff up, and of course, chiropractic tactics uh don't limit themselves anymore to just the back they right. think they're well many of them um practice or have uh, broadened the spectrum of their and you know it, it doesn't take a lot of investigation to figure out just to what degree this is all a bunch of quackery right um and it's been demonstrated over and over again. It's just unfortunate that so much of our, well, certainly in Canada, I don't know what it is in the States, but uh, it's actually covered under under uh, medical. Yeah. So that, uh, you know, people can go in and see chiropractors and taxpayers are paying for uh, the pseudoscientific uh, um, discipline, if you want to call it that. Right. Um, but yeah, there you go. It's sort of like being medically so that's, clear that's to go see chiropractic. Yeah, it's like medically being clear to go see an astrologist. You say, Oh, I had a, right. I had a series exactly. of really bad headaches. And my doctor here is what I'm saying yeah. says, you know what, you should probably go see Madame Divine at the <laughs> at the set at the psychic right. tundra yes. next to the pawn shop and I the think, laundry. I mat think Mars is in the town. fourth house and uh you know, and it's opposing the sun sign. Mm -hmm. um, yes, your, your the, planets are astray. Yes, yes. The weirdest, funniest thing, though, is how you can, after as as just human beings, if no one's ever went through the research to or went through the effort to understand what chiropractor is, even watching like a YouTube video, like if you aren't looking for it, you won't find it. What you'll end up with is being in a culture where people will speak highly of visits that they've had to the chiropractor. People who mention it in passing without describing some of the the issues with the science or the lack of, they will just mention it as in, oh, I went to a doctor today, I checked out some chiropractors, and then I went to a dentist. Like in my head, I'm not having any alarms, but I, through just association, pulling these two things together and legitimizing it just by virtue of the fact that I'm not critically assessing what I'm what I'm paying attention to because that takes effort. But the fact is the if if someone made a case saying, hey, I went to a chiropractor and I had a really good time, and then after the fact had to realize, oh, wait a second, is this guy just pseudoscience? That's so much harder. That's so much of a harder barrier to go over because now they've had that sure. personal experience, like your friend who saw a ghost. Now they have to realize, yep. well, then what did I experience? Was it actually a ghost or was I hallucinating? What about all the times where I declared in public that I did see a ghost? Now I have to go back to my friends and like, by the way, I was wrong about the ghost thing. Or go to my chiropractor and cancel my appointments. Right. And then realize it's just the fact that exactly. someone's touching you, giving you a lot of adrenaline and masking yep. pain or symptoms temporarily so that I walk out and then I feel good in the moment. But then the symptoms yep. as a whole were not we'll see effect, resolved. Right? exactly yeah. yeah that takes a lot of effort exactly. it takes a lot of growth and, and, and people yes and people are so you know they want to be confident yes. in what their senses report to them yes um, and and you know so you know i saw it with my own eyes well you know there's probably circumstances where your eyes have definitely 
uh, reported the wrong thing to you. And actually, I, I point out to some people, uh, you know, who say uh, they definitely saw a UFO or whatever. I say, hold a quarter at arm's length. That is called the fovea. And that is what your eye actually sees. Mm. Everything else is just filler. Your brain just fills in everything else. I said, you know, they, of course, they don't believe that. And I say, well, you, you know, you have an optic nerve and that's called a blind spot. Do you see your blind spot? And they say, no. And I say, well, there you go. That's your brain filling in the yeah. filling in along with that like can you see the bridge of your nose not when you're actually paying attention to your nose your or not right missing. and yeah the, the main brain point does here, a lot to construct uh, yeah. anyway right it, the right. the brain runs on input and if it doesn't have any it'll supply its own though larry and i have both seen ufos right larry you've seen at least yeah, one ufo absolutely. right no I've seen UFOs. I saw one this weekend. Like it's just an unidentified oh, flying it, object. It's right? something that's flying that you can't identify. Yeah, exactly. We <laughs> saw a bright star. It looked like a star, but it was a cloudy night. We thought it was a blimp. You know, probably being like reflecting from some of the moonlight, but we didn't know. We thought it either it was like some sort of blimp or like a very slow moving thing, maybe a satellite, maybe a man made low orbit satellite. But we, there, unidentified flying objects exist. I think the repercussion that comes with it is when people start saying. I saw something I didn't understand and it must be aliens or an angel or extra right. dimensional travelers. Like that extra step from, I don't know to, and this is my conclusion. Right. That's mm -hmm. the problem. That's the thing. Yeah. So, the leap uh, of logic. <laughs> that's the part where yeah, special absolutely. pleading starts to make yeah. it, it knock on the door and be like, Hey, do you need an excuse to believe the thing that you believe in? Why do you, <laughs> I can help out with that. I was about to make an analogy that kids would not understand who watch your show. I think you know, when a door-to-door -door vacuum salesman opens up your door and he throws a fistful of dirt onto your carpet, I don't know if that's ever happened to anybody, but that's happened to us <laughs> once. That's happened to us once in America. Can you believe that? And then they'd be like, I can suck that up. I'm like, you just gave me the problem. Religion and macrocosm or uh, microcosm. Larry, I would love to know, um, do you have examples of special pleading and how do you define it? Well, it, it goes back to the existence of God. A lot of that is like, you know, nothing comes from nothing, mm. right? You can't get something from nothing. Well, where did God come from? Oh, he's always been here. You know, right. that's a special pleading, you know, uh, that he never had a beginning. Okay, well, that, you're just making well, now up Now we have stuff. an example. Yeah, now right. we have an example of something that doesn't come from anything. Yeah. And also, you know, God made everything. Well, God made evil then. Oh, no, the devil made evil. Mm. Yeah, so it's it's an exception to the general rule that goes flying in the face of the general rule, but they claim it anyway. Right, it's, it's special pleading. So exactly, yeah. that's a really good point. We'll just... uh, so logic... William uh, Lane Craig uses that argument a lot. Yeah, mm -hmm. logically, if you say uh, the Kalam cosmological argument. Uh -huh. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll it continue. must be me. <laughs> so, Dred, if you had logically set up a uh, an argument for why God needs to exist by saying everything has to come from something, right? In my head, I hear that I think, okay, all right. So much so far as a first statement, I can, I can, I can understand what you're talking about. Okay, now let's talk about God. Where did he come from? Well, he doesn't count. <laughs> right. <laughs> or what? What did he make the universe out of? Like, you know, yeah, since there was nothing around, nothing but him. You know, even if you were to follow that argument from in the explicit order for how things are created, like God created light, first first thing, and He said it was good. In my mind, light works. Light works by bouncing off of things and bouncing back into your receptor, right? Like so, you can see mm -hmm. something. A light source exists. Bounce photons are emitted. They bounce off a physical object or something that has mass that I can interact with, those photons bounce off that substance and they go into my uh, detectors, my eye detectors, and I can see things. That's how light works. If light was the first thing to exist and it was good, how did you know it even existed? Because otherwise, it's like me shining a flashlight into deep space. That light's just going to keep going and never going to come back to me. It's going to be effectively as dark. It will be just as dark as if right. there was no light at all. 
So what was the point of that being the first step if there was what nothing was else preceding for, that? Nothing else to reflect off of. Yeah, what you're yeah. Saying. It's yeah. one of the it's one of the weird follies of oh, this was written by a person who doesn't understand physics or light, right? And if you go to a physicist and you say, hey, if I don't have anything and I shine light on it, will it bounce off anything? It's like no, because that's not how light works. It's like great. So chapter one of the Bible, first first literally first line, <laughs> more or less. You're like, well, that doesn't count. If I'm a Christian physicist, I'd be like, well, here's the exception to the rules because uh, maybe there was a miasma. It's like, if that Anything was the thing to make it work. Yeah. yeah Post ad yeah. hoc rationalizations are really, mm -hmm. really frustrating to hear from a, from an yeah. atheist point of view. Uh, Larry, more on the idea of special pleading. How could I recognize, even as an atheist, if I'm go uh, operating under special pleading? Like, have you well, met I would think just be uh, just be honest with yourself. Mm -hmm. If you make some con contradictory statement, mm -hmm. uh, you may not recognize it yourself because you were raised with it. But when somebody tells you about it, recognize the truth in what they tell you, and don't just try to push it away from you mentally. You know, nice. in other words, think about your beliefs, especially if somebody brings up the problem with those beliefs. Don't just blow them away. Think about them. Try right. to try to see how you you might be wrong in this particular situation it doesn't Very mean the whole thing's wrong you just think about that one thing and go from there yeah and don't worry about here with my thought don't worry so much about meaning to change your conclusion right because if you put so much your 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 belief or your confidence in the conclusion will adjust once you start caring about how you got to your conclusion so you don't have mm -hmm. to worry about like oh do i have to believe something different it's like no you just need to start caring about how you approach beliefs when right, you your method that, is 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 crucial. Yes, when you start thinking about how you what your sources are, how you are coming to arrive at such high level of confidence, when you start putting investment into that, everything that comes downstream of that will be improved. And if you want that to still be, well, I still want to believe in a God. At least you'll come to a more rational level of why you believe in that God, which is totally fine. I want people to have more rational ways to get their conclusions. Right. The one thing I can respect is if somebody says they believe in god and i ask them why um common question why you yeah. know they'll say because i want to well that's honesty <laughs> they, that's honesty i can respect yeah. that okay fine you, you know, a lot of people want to believe in ufos and bigfoot and leprechauns you know Larry, at I least do you're believe being in UFOs. honest i believe in ufos are you calling me weird? my <laughs> special pleading right now uh UFOs no, are real. Not as long as not as long as you understand that they are just unidentified flying objects. That's exactly I, what they are. Yeah, I don't yeah, think that okay. that that's hypocritical or special pleading at all. No, I think though if I went to a convention for UFO con, people would be really upset if that's all I said they were. They'd be like, "No, you have to go. You have to buy the whole horse and well, carriage." I'm sure there's no. some that represent both camps there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, let me, let me try to think about one more thing on special pleading that I do, uh, know for myself, I really do care about why I believe things. Right. And so as Larry had mentioned, it's really important for you to think about the, the, the beliefs that I have. If you could, if you're watching the show, maybe jot down, like, what are the five most important beliefs that I have? Right. And like, those can be the things that you do believe, but then right next to them, Think about like why you believe them, how you got to those conclusions. And then what I want you to do is take, if you have these two pillars, right? You have the things that you believe and then you have why you believe them. Take that section of what you believe and literally, okay, take why you believe and cover it up, cover it up, right? And then replace the things that you do believe with five different um, but analogous uh, things. So like if I said, I believe in the Christian God, now I'm going to replace it with, um, Muslim God or is God from Islam or Jade or some other God. And then look at those reasonings again. Do any of those reasonings apply to that God that you believe in? Do, if you say, Hey, I'm the coolest person uh, in school. And my reason is because I have these fancy pants. If someone else had the fancy pants, would that person be the coolest person in school? Like does the reasons that you have specifically and necessarily support that God belief that you have? A good example that I have of this is I've taught, I've done this practice with someone and they said, well, I believe that the sun is my God because it sustains life. These are the reasons it sustains life. And without it, I wouldn't exist or life would cease to exist on earth. 
And that's why it's a God to me. And so the the follow-up that I had to him is, well, you know, we had some examples where let's just replace it with no sun. Um, if the sun stopped existing or if the sun was like two suns and there's like twice as much sunlight, we know, or if this, if we weren't worshiping the sun, we were worshiping planet Mercury or something like that. The, the main conclusion was we have planets that clearly have more sunlight than Earth, like Mercury or Venus. They're exposed to more solar radiation and there's no life being sustained. And in fact, it's almost as if UV light is antagonistic to life in general. Not only that, but we also know that if the sun were to go away, there's life on Earth that never even ex exposes itself to sunlight, like deep water fish that are insulated by layers and layers of ocean water, right? And maybe oh, even right. ice on top of that. So it seems like for the reasonings that you position for why the sun is a god, the sustainment of life through sunlight isn't necessarily a, a feature. It's just seem, it seems to be more like a byproduct of just enough sunlight and just really an atmosphere to filter out a lot of the UV. And that even if the sun was gone, we'd still have life on Earth. So what about these reasonings tie back to the sun being God? And I literally, this is the the end of the conversation was, well, you know what? That's actually pretty good. Maybe I should not have the sun be my God and think more about how the atmosphere sustains life. Because without that, then it seems like the life on earth would go away a lot faster. It's like, yeah, that's that would be at least an improvement, right? Because now he's thinking about his beliefs and he sees that his conclusions are changing. I'd love yeah. to just more people think about their beliefs in that way, just like in a formatted uh, thoughtful consideration, it's particularly yeah. if it's important to them. Yeah. On it, Larry. Yeah. Well, we were talking about methods, and uh, the method is all important to, to approach the truth. Uh, if you've got a faulty method, you're going to get faulty answers, and that's mm -hmm. why we, we rely so much on the scientific method. It's self-correcting. Uh, right. If a, if a scientist comes up and says, "Hey, I've got this theory, and here's my work." The first thing they're going to do is is they're going to send it out for peer review, and all of the people who have the same degrees that he does are going to and look at it and and try to understand it and replicate it. And if there's flaws in it, he will be the first to be notified over it. Correct. And especially if it's a long-standing theory, like a theory of evolution or something, even and, gravity, you know, which is still being um, challenged to this date. Yes. And if somebody comes up with a with an exception to that that disproves it. That person, the scientific community will make that person famous and rich because they want to know the truth, the truth above all else. Right. I have another example of special pleading, if you'd like to hear it. Yes, please. Um, when I'm out talking to people, you know, in my little Alaskan atheist booth, they come over and the first one of the first things uh, some of them want to do, want me to do is disprove their God. Because how can I how can I not believe in their God if I have no evidence against their God? You know, just prove it. And instead of you know taking the the onus the the responsibility of proving that their own God exists that they say it exists and has, you know, you would think the onus of proof would be on the person um, it is. owning the claim. It is now, but the thing the special pleading part of it is they disbelieve in all the other religions' gods hmm. and never try to disprove them. Never try to come up with evidence again. It's, but so they they can demand that we disprove it, but their special pleading is, oh, I don't have to, you do. Right, right, you know, type right. Of thing. Because by default, people are Christian because they were Christian before they even were aware that there are other options, right? That's yeah, how, a that's, Christian that's, family, yes. Yeah, yeah, that's the scary. When you change your default, mm -hmm. then it seems like the burden belongs to everybody else because you're living a default naturalistic life. You know, mm -hmm. it's both, and I'll, I'll throw this as our closing comment. It is both a fault of the human condition and society in general that um, the things that we get used to, we take for granted, whether they're good things or bad things. If you're a very talented writer, if you keep writing, eventually you'll feel like I, I'm not that good of a writer, <laughs> even though you might be really right. good. If you're a great artist and you keep putting beautiful pieces of art out, eventually you'll start feeling like my art's not as good. And so it's good to get reminders that you are a quality uh, person. You're a quality writer. You are a good person. But for even uh, thoughts or indoctrinated thoughts that were given to you, like Christianity, or if you grew up in an Islam family, you start to mm -hmm. think, oh, mm -hmm. this is my fundamental way of looking at the world. And everybody else who just doesn't fall into my dogma, they're wrong. That could be yeah. just as alarming, particularly when you start getting to an age where you start realizing, I don't feel as good of a person anymore because I believe in my God. Now I'm stuck in this loop where I'm constantly trying to reinforce my religious beliefs, not just to myself, but on other people to reinforce the feeling of adequacy 
that I used to get out of my religion, even though it is ultimately just a position on false hope, right? And that could be a spiral for a lot of people who are caught in a loop where they're just constantly trying to prove to their God that doesn't answer to them, doesn't talk to them, doesn't have any relationship with them on a tangible level, that they are, in fact, a good person or are worthy of love and are worthy of respect mm -hmm. and authority. Uh, it, Which it, goes directly against the, the basic teaching of Christianity. You're yes. not worthy. You were born in sin. <laughs> <laughs> You're nothing yeah. without Jesus. Yeah, it's it's a, it's a noxious poison that you can systematically keep giving yourself that you can get used to for a period of time, but I think long-wise cause a lot of harm overall. So it's really important that we recognize where we are, understand what special pleading is. And if you are listening to this and you are religious, think about, you know, if you are looking for a way out, you know, contact people who who's your local atheist so that you can uh or at least you know start going on some right. youtube channels to figure out how to get yourself free from like bad um loops of thoughts uh dread any final thoughts before we break well you can also get uh in contact with uh your local pastafarian really pastafarians because... will help you out for that okay i didn't know this well i'll tell you and i'll tell you why uh or i can tell you after the break Tell us after the break. I'd love to know this because sure. I wonder if this yeah. is another case of special pleading. <laughs> Let's just get mm -hmm. to the break. All right. Go ahead. But this is the Digital Free Thought Radio Hour on WOZO Radio 103.9 LPFM here in Knoxville, Tennessee. And we'll be right back after this short break. Welcome back to the second half of the Digital Free Thought Radio Hour. I'm Doubter Five, and we're on WOZO Radio 103.9. Nine LPFM here in Knoxville, Tennessee. Let's just take a moment to talk about the Atheist Society of Knoxville. ASK was founded in 2002. We're in our 21st year now and have 1,100 members. We have weekly in-person meetings every Tuesday evening in Knoxville's Old City at Barley's Tap Room and Pizzeria. Look for us inside at the high top tables or if it's pretty weather outside on the deck. You can find us online on Facebook, meetup.com, or go to our website at knoxvilleatheist.org. Yeah, it's just that simple. By the way, if you don't live in Knoxville, you should go to Meetup and do a search for an atheist group in your town. Don't find one? Start one. Start one. Start one. Right. Well, Matt, where do you want to pick up? I want to talk about special pleading. So it turns out that Dredd said that if you are stuck in a belief where you are worshiping a God, that you of uh, a God of nebula, nebulous existence, that you should reach out to a Pasiferian to hopefully help out with what? This is interesting now, because uh, so, what do you got, Dredd? So we distinguish ourselves in the following way, that <laughs> okay. our, our, our religion is as likely to be true as mm -hmm. any other. It's pretty good. So, well, it's a start, right? I mean, right. Uh, you know, other religions, of course, and e even the Abrahamic religions, like if if you're Jewish, you you believe in the same God as Christians and, and Muslims do, but you know, they're all still mutually exclusive. Um, certainly, if you're a Sikh, everyone else is wrong. If you're a Hindu, everyone else is wrong. If you're a Jew, everyone else is wrong. Pastafarians right. don't take that stance. We just say we are as likely to be true as any of the other religions in the world that have been, are, or will be. Hmm. And uh, so we we eliminate special pleading in the sense that we don't claim uh, exclusive, you know, exclusivity to uh, to truth or knowledge of uh, the underlying nature of the universe, uh, we just say, eh, it may be true, it may be not, we don't really care, but it's something we're uh, we're into right now. So there you go. That's cool. Ramen. I understand that, ramen, ramen. I understand yeah, the idea yeah, of man. like, hey, by us, so we're not supplanting your religious view of a of a monotheistic deity or even polyistic deity yeah. with another one what we're basically saying is we have a more open-minded option that's open to swinging <laughs> <That's right. laughs> which well, is just it, as likely goes, to be true like it's it an goes right back to the it goes right back to the god back guarantee like try yeah. us out for three months and if you don't like us your old god will probably take you back right 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 it's the <laughs> it's the god back guarantee that's yeah, cool. Yeah, 
uh, the <laughs> the George Carlin Joe Pesci rule, where it's, hey, I'm just going to start praying to Joe Pesci for the next couple of years, and we'll see if anything changes. And if not, I'm just going to keep sticking with that. Um, I was thinking about something uh, this week. Uh, as as we get older, we think about um, how what's more important. Like, is it my body? Is it the 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 good things that I can leave behind? The numbers in my bank account? And what I realized was, and I was alluding to this last week, is that I really do care about the legacy. The legacy that I have is very important to me. And the reason why I bring that up is because I know my body is temporary. But I could have a lasting impact that lasts longer than my 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 temporal form, my mortal coil, if you will. And what I mean by that is the good things that I do, the people that I make, the the things that I can teach, the discoveries in science that I can establish, the work that I can put forward and and move industry uh, through analytical research, support, just make, putting out good vibes. Like, even if I staffed my fingers and I disappeared today, I think those would have a positive lasting impact that I could say that I was happy to contribute to and and pioneer for. Um, that's very important for me. And I feel like if you were going to open up a book about Tyrone Wells, if I was fortunate enough to have something like that about 100 years from now, what they look back on isn't what I did yesterday when I woke up, brushed my teeth, took a shower and just like fed my cat and like all these mundane activities that I did. I, what I hope is that they can see a lasting impact of, wow, really good, strong, uh, positive influences in science, good support in the community, like s s good standards for safety in our laboratories. People got to go home safe, come to work in the same state that they did when they left. Everybody was like very positive with the amount of work that was being put out and the productivity they put up, picking up trash, helping the hungry, walking dogs on the weekend, a volunteer show. Like this guy did a, good, a lot of cool things and the good things are still around and more people are motivated to do them by virtue of the fact that this guy participated in it. Like that's the culture that I want to be able to stimulate. What I look back on in, um, when I look back on historical figures, what I realize is a lot of times we're not talking about that person specifically. We're talking about the legacy that they put out because we will put people on pedestals, historical figures, even uh, Ben Franklin. Uh, I don't know. Uh, George Washington. I'm, I'm trying to come up with a Canadian <laughs> <laughs> terrible figure, but my American history is yeah, not very yeah, good. Trudeau. OK, yeah, OK. Trudeau. My American history is just so U.S. centric. But when you look yeah. back on those figures in detail, you actually realize Ben Franklin was actually kind of a terrible person. George Washington, slave owner, like not a when he's fighting for freedom, he's not talking about women like the people that we have on like the Mount Rushmore is largely made by people who are looked like and could fund a Mount Rushmore. In fact, Roosevelt is on that uh, monument because he paid for it with taxpayer yeah. money so it's yeah. just this weird um echo chamber of people patting themselves on the back and as far as like a legacy is concerned yeah we can look at it and visit and be like wow americana wow this great historical impact but who are those people in general and now i wonder about religious figures we know a lot about we think we know a lot about jesus we think we know a lot about moses and and isaac and abraham and all these other figures but do we really know anything about them or do we just understand a legacy that they um, still have as an impact on society. And is that legacy and is that impact positive or if it, or under microscope, is it actually far more noxious, far worse oh. than we could have ever imagined? And if I were to think oh. of like the impact that Jesus has had on society overall, I can't think of one person who's been responsible for more deaths in human history than that person or the inhibition of science or the inhibit or the, um, uh, support of ignorance or family conflict or you know just prejudice in general from just one person's legacy maybe that guy didn't even know what he was about to do if there was a collection of different people put together but that legacy has a lasting impact that i find to be a net negative actually so if that's well, a strong what do you think dread is that is that fair I, to say I, I, I was gonna say that uh often i mean certainly people most people i i think don't set out with the notion that they're creating a legacy mm. that they're just they're just acting they're just acting according to their their own temperament their own personality their own motivations and their temporary goals and that 
after the fact, if uh, they've had an impact on society, it's the constructed narrative after the fact that makes the legacy. Mm. And, you know, you brought, you brought up Jesus and um, certainly what, what, even what he was saying at the time when he was alive and doing his ministry um, wasn't really the legacy because that's what Paul created. Paul created the true legacy of Jesus, uh, which is, you know, Gentiles are, uh, you know, can be saved and all the rest of it. Um, and uh, like I've, I've listened to Bart Ehrman, this uh, uh, New Testament scholar, and uh, some real deep dives into this stuff. And it's, uh, it's very surprising the different messages uh, that Paul had with respect to Jesus' teachings. And what Jesus had to say right out of his own mouth. So um, that's what I mean by legacy being uh, a constructed narrative, gen usually mm. after the fact. Um, you know, like George Washington and all of, you know those guys. They were all acting as members of their time, right? And right. you know, trying to do what their temperaments and uh, motivations and all the rest of it guided them to do. <laughs> but you know people embellish stories after the fact and uh all of a sudden you know you have these people that uh could not possibly be as good um as uh history remembers them <laughs> right and i wonder is that a fair representation of them would that be something they'd even recognize or would they say man i die twice once in actuality and two in the minds of everybody as you replace right. me with this mascot who has my same face and name and purports yeah. ideals that I didn't even support <laughs> at the end of the day. Uh, Larry, yeah. I wonder, um, questions of legacy. Do you feel like the lasting impact of Jesus um, as on, on society has been a positive or a negative legacy? Is, if that's fair, if well, that's a fair question, if not, feel free to make it over. Well, uh, to be fair, he had some good things to say about equality, or not even equality, but um, if you're with sin, uh, be the first to cast a stone, you know, that type of thing. Mm. But it was far outweighed by all the negative stuff that he supported. Now, the first thing that he did, which was a problem and brought a lot of harm into his new religion, was he, he supported and validated the Old Testament. You know, not one jot and tittle yes. of the Old Testament exactly. old law will pass away. So I he agree. brought all of that baggage into his his new message of hope. I agree. He and also, he he was the one who created hell, and there was no hell before, no eternal punishment before the New Testament. So, yeah. I mean, that's a whole big bunch of um, problems and and harm uh, to be that he that he created for us right there. Now, uh, he, that's him. That's himself and his own legacy. But then, religions, of course, you know, are things like uh, they grow up from those, and they differ, and they split, and they have thirteen thousand different denominations. Now, if you disagree with a scientist, you are either right or wrong, and you can prove it. If you disagree with the church, you just start a new church, and that's how they splinter and move on. Sure, right across but, the street from <clears> sometimes. And, you know, that's oh. where you get into it. it splits mankind into warring factions. And that's mm -hmm. another huge problem that he brought to the world. Dread, you, I mean, Larry, you completely overlooked the biggest thing that Jesus ever did, which was destroy that fig tree. Like, he's like, mm -hmm. hey, someone else's fig tree. Oh, there's no figs in it. You're gone. And some yeah. guy's like, hey, and that's my fig of, tree. And it was out of season, too. What are you doing? You can't just do that. It's like, I I hated that tree. It didn't have a fig for me. It's like, even if it did and they weren't for you, that was my fig tree. What are you doing? Right. All right, Jed. He's destroying <laughs> personal property. All right. Trent, I see you. What's He's up? a vandal. He's a vandal. He's a vandal. Um, <laughs> but he's, he's the ultimate salesman, right? Because mm. uh, like you point out, Larry, there was no hell. So he creates hell. Yes. And then, and then puts himself forward as the solution to that problem yes right it's like right. any any product mm -hmm. you know they they create the problem and then say and we as it turns out have the solution 
by me, right? Right. right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, it was almost as if it was missing a component because the situation was you're a sinner. And that was, you know, Old Testament. What's the repercussion of being a sinner? Uh, God doesn't like you that much. I was like, okay, okay. Is that it? More or less? It's like, yeah, it's fine. Then Jesus is like, by the way, if you're a sinner, internal damnation. You're like, oh, now that's a problem. So what's the solution? Jesus also. So, yeah. yeah well, it, I mean, in the Old Testament, they could just... They could just do animal sacrifice, you know, and get back True. in with, uh, get back in good with with God. But in the in the if future, you're a landowner and if you own property that you can uh, uh, destroy for for no other purpose, not to feed your family or anything like that, if you had what is it dispensable income, yes, then you can save yourself. Which makes it very clear what kind of status or caste Old Testament was uh, supporting, right? Right. Like if, if you have property to destroy, then yeah, you can be saved. Everybody else, mm, sorry, sorry, get some goats and burn them. And this is exactly <laughs> with some furnace and and ur yeah. and all that other stuff. Uh, yeah. Well, and there's a there's another case of special pleading is this idea of uh, animal sacrifice being something that was pleasing to the Lord. Um, you know that I mean nobody in modern society I don't think would uh, consider. Uh, trying to rationalize that in, in any way or seeing that as a um uh, you know a reasonable part of their own history history right mm. uh like moving forward why would you believe in a god now that used to be pleased by the killing of animals and the burning of their flesh um that's pretty bizarre <laughs> yeah, but with the New Testament, you don't have to do that anymore because Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice. Yes, yeah, so <laughs> however, I, I, you know, I however, understand. I'm, I'm just yeah. saying that that again is, you know, sort of a it's a uh, it's it, it's a, a special pleading to excuse the behavior of a God right. who demanded <clears throat> right. that in the first yeah. place. Right. I was just going to say, however, you know, even though Jesus did sacrifice Himself and replace all the other sacrifices, you're still a sinner. You know, yeah. you're still damned to hell unless you yeah. follow the, the that particular church's doctrine about accepting Jesus and, and tithing and following the religion. Yes, very true. Um, I also wonder, so I have uh, a mom who loves me very much, and uh, she's a Jehovah Witness, and she will send me brochure. Well, she will ask now to, before she sends me brochures for uh, Jehovah, right? And uh, she'll call me on the phone. And if that conversation ever gets to religion, she she knows I'm an atheist. She's supportive of that, which is really big on her. But she'll say, Ty, I have brochures. Would you like to see one for, you know, Watchtower, The Truth, et cetera? And I I made the, the point. I don't know the exact wording, but I said, basically, Mom, if I sent you a brochure for Allah, would that you would you would agree that you would need more than a brochure to believe in a law, right? And she's like, yeah, of course, I'd need more than a brochure to believe in more or less any other God, <laughs> except for my one God. That's right? special pleading, right there. Yeah, then yeah. that's an example of special pleading. I could I can label it, but it doesn't have the impact until you understand the the importance of caring about why you believe things, right? And I right. think that's the justified yeah. point. As atheists, we are very quick to point out the logical flaws and errors. But they fall on deaf ears if we're talking to people who don't care if their beliefs are true and just care right. about Absolutely. what they believe and not why they believe it. And it's really up to us, honestly, to transition from the it, and there's still a place for it. Uh, I think in like public debates, I think it's a really good place. But transition from attacking the conclusion or pointing out the mm -hmm. errors and more of inspiring people to critically assess why they arrived at their conclusions we can do that in a multitude of different ways but that's the key to getting people to start thinking about this stuff and having a higher standard of evidence i think another problem too and i'm going to get in my i'm going to get in my old person soapbox but i think we are living in a culture where less and less so we are afraid to tell people that they're wrong <laughs> i knew when i was a kid yes. you i hear dread and larry nodding their head so hard uh when i was a kid yeah. When I was wrong, my teacher would just be like, that's that's wrong. They wouldn't say incorrect. Like, they'd be like, that's wrong. And I'd be like, oh, I'm wrong. I have to get right. I have to figure out how to fix this. Then, like, around, like, high school, it was like, well, you're incorrect. 
And I, and I was like, huh, that's weird because I know I'm wrong. <laughs> 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 but I'm I'm not correct. So like, what else would that leave the wrong? And then I think like around college, like I would say things that I almost knew were not right or at least were tenuous at best. And people would be like, well, it's a difference of opinion, right? And I'm like, how can that be? It's a binary yes or no situation, black, white situation. Like I've made it either X or not X. Like there's, it's a true dichotomy. How can it be a difference of opinion? Like that's something that I'd like to investigate more. And then as my adulthood continued, I realized that it wasn't just me. I feel like culturally, at least as far as America goes, we've been more concerned with not letting people know that you are wrong on things to the point where with people who have access to the internet are now very confident about the, the rabbit holes they've fallen in and the 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 cropping of other opinions to have a perfectly catered uh point of view to that fits their ideals their dogmatic thinking their their closed mindedness and so when they are ex express an opinion that's flatly wrong i had a guy literally tell me well all asians wear glasses <laughs> <laughs> i said that's wrong and he was offended like i i heard him i was like well I, I what do you mean that's not even what i just said it's like literally you just said all asians wear glasses like oh I, what's the problem with that it's like i'm literally telling you the idea is wrong like you 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 said a wrong thing that's factually incorrect like like what what way can i make this where your opinion personally isn't you and you can rectify that situation because we can uh, go. Yeah, what was your method at arriving at yeah. that information? Yeah. So like we need to culturally get used to the idea that being wrong is a good thing because then you can understand how to be right. Understanding that you don't know something is a good thing because that's how you can start your journey to start learning new things. Like it's not just about being correct from beginning to end. You, that's a boring life. Like the scientific method, the process of discovery, the exciting thing about learning stuff is that you realize that you are wrong on certain things and you have an opportunity to fix it. Without that, I don't feel like you're living to your true standard. And it doesn't work until you realize what being wrong is and understanding and valuing that. That's that's the measure of doubt. That's the value of understanding that we're in a world where we can learn new things. And that's my purpose in life. That's hopefully a legacy that I can give to other people. Dread, I see your hand up. What's up? No, just to say that truth and facts are not subjective. Right. Yes. That these yeah, there is an objective reality, and it's not just about how I feel about it. Yes. And this is and this is where I think our culture has taken a bit of a spin. Mm, is right. people are believing that it's true for me. Yeah. My no, truth. no, no, no. It's not true for you. It's true or it isn't true, independent of whether you exist or not. Right. And and that's what people have to get their uh, their sloppy brains around. <laughs> <laughs> OK. All right. And and special pleading is a good way to recognize that the way how I think about it is special pleading. It's it's wrapping paper. It's wrapping paper, but it's scratch and sniff wrapping paper that smells like dog poop. Right. And my opinion is you can special plead around a good conclusion like i can wrap gift wrap paper sure. that i actually yeah. want but the question is is why would i do that why would i give someone a gift of special pleading wrapped good ideas when they have that idea and they think oh it's sticky and it smells like dog poop why would you wrap up a good idea with this it didn't need it get rid of it maybe find a better wrapping paper for it or no wrapping paper at all good ideas truth doesn't need any frosting on top of it you know like just give me the truth that's really all i need all special pleading does is get in the way yeah, I, I can understand. I can understand the need for having a a, a reason. Mm. Now, uh, you know, you don't have a reason, so you make something up that sounds reasonable to you. Mm. It, it's thinky and it, it's a false wrapping paper, but it, it's a reason. I can understand it and, mm. and see them doing that. Yeah, uh, it's just a, a, a human need. You know, that's a very good you point. Know, the only reason you should ever wrap dog poop. <laughs> is to have something to light on fire at somebody's door, right? Right. Only on Halloween. Right. Larry, you alluded to a really good point because I can put wrapping paper around an empty box and now that empty mm -hmm. box suddenly has so much more value. It looks at very tantalizing, but it's still an empty box. Right. So that's another danger with special right. pleading. I can yeah. completely wrap it around things that don't even exist or a complete waste of time or space or just things that mm -hmm. take up space but have no merit, tensile strength or something to support yeah. with in the time of need. And how yeah. many of my ideas are basically just specialty wrapped uh, papers? Just because I'm an atheist doesn't mean that I'm prone or not prone to um, 
fooling yeah. myself on some good ideas. There's some things that I yeah. really need to adjust. Uh, but- like an example, is, you know, the guy lives in, in Africa and he has little kids and the kids say, why do giraffes have such long necks? And you don't know the answer. Hmm. But you say, oh, well, so they can reach the highest limbs and get the juicy leaves up there. So they, their necks, you know, have over time stretched to get there. That's the wrong answer. But it gave him something to pass on. It, he, right. he had a reason that he could fall back on it, even though it was wrong. Right. It's very um, true. Uh, I want to throw out one random story before we close. And I do feel. Oh, it, don't forget our customer. Ah, all right. yes, our yes. Listener good point, comments. Good point. So we got a We did get a listener comment. This one's from. Uh, uh, Mudahar. <laughs> Mudahar, I believe uh, the name, and th- he or she said, what is your criteria if you guys claim, I'm trying to uh, make it YouTube friendly. Basically, you're saying, uh, this is from our last show that we posted. Uh, oh, actually, it's not from our last show. This is from the show, It's All in Your Head. Um, that's from two weeks ago. And they refer to, well, what's your criteria? And I imagine they're referencing, well, if you said something is morally good or morally not good, as atheists, what do you determine as a good way to determine what is morally good or morally not if you don't believe in God? So what's your criteria? I'll throw it up to you, Larry. Oh, well, mine is pretty easy. It's harm. If it does no harm, it's morally ambiguous. If it helps the person or society or whatever, then it's good morality. And if it harms people financially, emotionally, physically, whatever, then it's it's negative uh, morality. Um, but really, all you really need to know have is compassion and empathy for your fellow man. Mm. If you have that, it'll take you nine tenths of the way to a good moral standard of your own. Yeah, uh, and mine mine is a bit Kantian, so like I don't have a short answer. My 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 idea is my preference is I don't know. Right. But I have models that I find to be very reliable. And until then, I'm willing to listen to other models and then assess them on uh, their ability to maximize well-being and reduce needless harm. Right. And I will listen to I will listen to the models and I'll try to apply that strategy to them. And based on how well they do those two things, maximize well-being and, and minimize needless harm, then I'll replace whatever model I have with that next more better improved model. And right now I have a model that's pretty good, can always be improved, and is constantly learning and self-correcting. And I like to think of morality less of a, less of a, a list of edicts and a set of rules and more of an evolving system based on social contracts that we develop and science and and a better understanding of the consequences of my action. And I understand that that's a longer answer than just whatever God said. But the problem with that is it's not as comprehensive for a lot of the more nuanced problems that can come up in life. Whereas I feel like mine's a much more multifaceted approach to learning how to be a better person rather than just following a bunch of rules that I'm trying to be obedient to. Dred, what's your response? I'm just gonna say that I almost take a Bayesian approach Okay. That uh, you just you keep updating your priors. You start yes. with the premise that you want to uh, accentuate human flourishing, and as you say, reduce harm. Mm-hmm. But your actions always have to be amenable to updates, mm. so that you know we we continually look to expand our moral, you know, the improve our moral choices. Mm. And that's by updating our priors uh, with new evidence and new information. And uh, we have because, uh, you know, in contrast, uh, getting your morality from a book or from a God is that's it. I mean, he's spoken and there is no there's no changing the law, as it were. Mm. Right. Um, But taking a Bayesian approach, at least you're updating your priors and and leaving yourself open to improvement. I like the Bayesian uh, approach. I also like the Kantian approach because it separates it separates moral actions from necessarily what I should do or what I need to do. It just makes this new category of oughts, which is, hey, you no, ought you're to talking have about done... David Hume. David uh, Hume. Is that not Kant? No, that's Hume. Okay. Uh, uh, that is Categorical imperative doesn't refer to what you ought to do and what you shouldn't do and making methods of determining. Well, so the categorical imperative was Kant. 
Yes. But uh, the art, the art and is thing was Hume. Okay, so was Conscious informed by Hume's book and then put it into Kant and into his work? Well, Kant was before Hume. Okay. Hume well, after. I'm referring to the example that Kant came up with, which is like the axe murder at someone's door, right? Is that Hume? Are you saying that's Hume? Uh, I'm not familiar with the axe murder. Sure, so, Kant, so Kant came up with the example of there's an axe murder at your door. Should you open up? And he and the axe murderer says, "I'm going to kill the person, your wife." Uh, it, it's and and it's up to you to determine whether or not you should open up the door or lie to him and say, "No, my wife's not here. Go away." Because if you'd lie to him, he'll walk away. But he then said, "Morally, you shouldn't lie, right?" So morally, you shouldn't lie, but you still shouldn't. You ought not lie, but you still shouldn't open up the door. Like you can come up with completely different metrics to determine what you ought to do morally versus what you should do uh, practically. The the the, the okay. overall takeaway that I had from reading it, and this thing is much more complicated. It's it's a more nuanced level of understanding morality sure. versus <clears throat> what you should do. And the value of it is you can use morality as sort of like an objective measuring stick and just say, ah, that seemed to be the most moral course of action, but let's see what they actually did and look at the consequences left and right for, uh, from, a, from a more distance point of view. I appreciate the idea that you can look at things a bit more dispassionately rather than just saying, well, I did because I had to do it. It's like, well, let's find out what you actually did and see if we can improve it. Because a lot of people would, for example, jump into a, I see, I see Larry. Well, a lot of people will jump into like water to save somebody, but it actually turns out the fact that if you try to drown, uh, save a drowning person, jumping in to save them is like one of the worst things you could do because they'll grab you yes. and you'll be pulled down too. Maybe you can get a life, yeah. uh, life raft or something. Yeah. Like that. So there, there's an experience. Like experiment experiment out there i don't have time to go into it right now mm. but the listener should look up the trolley experiment experiment mm. the trolley experiment uh, oh yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, for morality it's, it's very good reading and a short film that will explain a lot how how difficult true morality is to to uh come by cool yeah all right that's the show uh dread anything you'd like to plug for next week um i'll have to give it some thought <laughs> okay <laughs> okay uh for me i would say um don't be scared if you see drones you're already being viewed by multiple security cameras and <laughs> left yeah, and right and, and don't yeah don't for worry me. about getting vaccinated because you're already getting tracked on your phone <laughs> yeah <laughs> i would say yeah for anyone who has a smartphone but doesn't want to get vaccinated like you you have your your priorities completely out of order uh but yes uh larry anything that you'd like to say and remember god is always watching yes and god is always watching. <laughs> what's your problem always under surveillance surveillance yeah. uh you can find this show on podcasts everywhere just search for digital free thought radio hour if you're watching this on youtube be sure to like and subscribe if you're having trouble leaving religious beliefs behind, you can get help at recoveringfromreligion.org. My content can be found at digitalfreethought.com. Be sure to click on the blog button for more radio show archives, uh, atheist songs, and many articles on the subject. I have a book. Uh, it's Atheism, What It's it All About on Amazon. And my YouTube channel handle is at Doubter5. Every, remember, everybody is going to somebody else's hell. The time to worry about it is when they prove that heavens and hells and souls are real. Mm. Until then, don't sweat it. Enjoy your life. And we'll see you next Wednesday night at 7 o'clock here on WOZO Radio Knoxville. Say bye, everybody. Uh, bye-bye. 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 Oh. Good, good show. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Good show, everybody. <laughs>